This program is brought to you by Emory University. Uh, well, good morning. Uh, morning. So I'm Robert Shapiro, Dean of the Law School. I, I think I've met everyone here, but if I haven't, I look forward to meeting you afterwards. It's my job to provide a little break between the morning entertainment and the afternoon entertainment. A little serious academic work here. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about the United States Supreme Court. But first, thank you very much for being here on our alumni weekend. As we were saying last night, this time we celebrate and thank our alumni for their support. So we're very glad that you're here today. And please come back and visit often. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the United States Supreme Court and reviewing the last term. This is really the time of year when you look back and look forward. The new term starting the first Monday of October. But I feel like I still have a chance to review what happened during the past term. So my plan is to talk about some of the overall characteristics, some statistics relating to this past term of the Supreme Court, and then to talk about a few, I think, particularly significant cases that were decided over the past year. All right, now, when we think about this court, we often think about it as a divided court, a court dominated by Justice Kennedy. You can only know how they're going to vote, since that's the question. Is that the way it actually plays out? Uh, and the answer is often in law school is, I guess it depends. So I want to look at some statistics that we have looking at the most recent term of the Supreme Court, comparing to some of the other terms of the Roberts Court, and then comparing to an earlier term, 1990 to 1993, chosen mainly at random. It's also, I was clerking then, so I figured that was the important day. So some of these uh, interesting characteristics, by the way, I do have to note that they don't really work hard much these days, right? I mean, we thought 116 cases a year, that wasn't too much. It used to be 150 cases a year. Huh, now 73. What are they doing? Anyhow, uh, of course, depending upon how you feel, maybe you're thinking it's too much. It would be better if it were fewer. All right. Now, some ways of looking at this court, you know, interesting number of cases decided unanimously this past term, 66%. It's one of the highest percentages since World War II. See, typically it had been, you know, around 50% of the cases decided nine to nothing. So by that measure, you could say it's not really a divided court, right? They're all coming together. However, put a little asterisk there, because as I'll discuss, we'll see a number of these opinions. It's nine to zero on the judgment. No one dissents. However, often in the Supreme Court, what's most important isn't exactly who wins and who loses, <laughs> except if you're a party, and that's all you care about, but it's the opinion. Uh, do the justices all join one opinion, or are they deeply divided? And as we'll see, this unanimity may mask some underlying divisions. How about cases decided 5-4, right, those most uh, divided cases? Well, in going maybe around uh, 20, 20 to 30 percent, only 14 percent this past term. So I think that does suggest, perhaps, um, a little less division. Fewer cases that sharply divided the court over this past term, although, again, as we'll see, the votes on the judgment may not fully reveal these divides. And then the question is, is Justice Kennedy really in the driver's seat? One way of looking at that is, in those closely divided 5-4 decisions, is it Justice Kennedy who cast the decisive vote? And the answer to this past term is yes. 100% of the time, in 5-4 to four cases, Justice Kennedy was in the majority. Uh, he is, as we say, usually <laughs> the way to bet if you want to know who's going to be in the majority in five, four cases, and that bet would have been a, a real winner uh, this past term. All right, uh, some other measures. Now, this is of the five, four majorities. Uh, question here is, do they break down along ideological lines? So in these most divided cases, you might say some of the cases the court hears, they all agree on, not so divided. They get there for a variety of reasons. But in those most divided cases, does the court break down along ideological lines? <laughs> And the basic answer is yes. So what the gray represents are the non-ideologically divided 5-4 decisions, where it breaks down something other than Justice Kennedy and the liberal bloc or Justice Kennedy and the conservative bloc. You see, pretty consistently, about 2 thirds or more of the time, when the Supreme Court divides 5-4, they divide along these ideological lines of Justice Kennedy with the liberal justices or Justice Kennedy with the conservative justices. And of those times, about two thirds of those times, it's the conservative justices that win. So it does lend some support to the idea, a divided court with Justice Kennedy in the middle, but maybe a little to the right. Again, two thirds of the time, he votes with the conservatives in these most divided cases. All right, now I want to talk about who wins. 
on this United States Supreme Court. Right? Now, typically, the big winner in the United States Supreme Court tends to be the United States. They're good at arguing. They, they uh, argue the criminal cases. The government typically has done very well in criminal cases historically in the Supreme Court. So historically, the United States wins 60 to 70 percent of the time. Now, th what I want to start with are the statistics not for the most recent term, but for the term before that. Let's look at two terms. So uh, in 2012, 2013, <clears throat> the United States won 40 percent of the time. Very low success rate for the United States. Who were the institutional parties who won a lot two years ago? The United States Chamber of Commerce. They were the big winner. 82 percent of the time, the United States Chamber of Commerce won when it was either a party or an amicus. This past term, uh, the United States had a bit of a comeback. They were back to their historic levels of winning about 70 percent of the time, but still not as successful as the Chamber of Commerce. The United States Chamber of Commerce still is the leading institutional litigant to some extent supporting the view that this is a court that cares about business, right? Business, the business-oriented court, maybe don't always care about some of those divided social issues. Maybe they do. But business is what drives this court. Uh, and if you look historically, again, uh, some statistics from the Roberts Court as opposed to another court, see the Chamber of Commerce winning about 70% of the time from 2006 to 2010 as opposed to 43%. Uh, in that earlier period. Now, the Burger Court was often thought of as being a conservative court in many ways. And part of what we're seeing are the evolution on the Supreme Court, perhaps mirroring the evolution in society of what it means to be a conservative. Whether conservative means the government wins, or whether conservative means <laughs> the government loses <laughs> and business wins. Right? And we see some of that evolution in what it means to be a conservative reflected a bit on the United States Supreme Court. Uh, one other statistic, public opinion. These days they poll everybody, right? Uh, and so it's, it's sometimes thought that people understand sometimes the side you like is going to win on the Supreme Court, sometimes it's going to lose. But what you want is a Supreme Court that's different from the other political branches. It's not just politics, right? They're not just politicians in robes. And the general view is, so to the extent that judges are viewed as being impartial, the public generally supports the Supreme Court when they're perceived as being more political, a lower level of support. So what we see is, by historic standards, a relatively low level of favorability for the United States Supreme Court. Uh, actually, last term, right after the Supreme Court found that parts of the Voting Rights Act were unconstitutional, found historic low favorability for the Supreme Court, below 50 percent for really the first time in history. Again, I think the view, uh, the supposition was that this reflected a concern the court was political. Also, um, African Americans as a group support the Supreme Court in general at a higher percentage than any other group, but not after the Voting Rights Act was held unconstitutional. So I see a little bit of a bounce back here, 56 percent, higher than it was, still very low by historic standards. Maybe that reflects a view of the court as political. Maybe that reflects just a little bit of lack of confidence in the institutions of government. Um, I was in uh, Washington last week visiting with our alumni. I have to say, if you talk to the president or Congress, how would you feel if your favorability was 56 percent? They would be celebrating those kinds of statistics. So maybe it's all a bit relative of what we can expect in this time when there's a certain skepticism about government in general. All right, so let's talk about some of the themes that maybe we'll see play out this term. So we see unanimous rulings, but maybe not always unanimous opinions. And focus on that to see the, how somehow a 9 to 0 result can mask underlying divisions. Now, we will see precedent in general survive. But I say survived because, as we'll see, there were significant challenges to precedent, suggesting maybe a willingness in later terms to overrule certain precedents. Uh, again, this sort of stuff that, I'm sorry, law professors like to talk about different ways of interpreting law. Whether you look at the text, what are the words? Or if you look a little more at the history, at the purpose, and we'll see the court being divided here about the right way to interpret the Constitution or statutes. And then this question of, is this the case that this is the court in some way libertarian? What might we mean by that? Again, skeptical about government power, perhaps a little more supportive of claims of individual rights. Uh, so we will keep our eye on that theme as we talk about some of the cases of this Supreme Court. All right. First kind of case we're going to talk about is structure of government. 
And here we have represented the key features of our structure of government. Separation of powers, represented by a tree with the three branches of government. International law, the flags of different countries. Federalism, my book, uh, now available still on Amazon. So in any case, uh, <laughs> I uh, probably remaindered there, so get it very cheap. OK, anyhow, about, about federalism. All right, so what was the case? United States versus Bond. Here are the facts. Carol Ann Bond learns her best friend, Merlinda Haynes, is pregnant. Great news. Uh, Carol Ann Bond realizes that her husband is the father of her friend's child. Bad news. <laughs> right? Uh, turns out Carol Ann Bond is a biochemist working with hazardous chemicals. Worse news uh, for her friend, because then Carol Ann Bond gets this idea of putting toxic chemicals on her friend's mailbox, her car, her house, as a way of exacting revenge. Now, she got those chemicals, some of, from her workplace, and some, by the way, I would sorry for this to be our audience participation. If you were trying to get dangerous chemicals, where, how would you get them? School apps. School apps. How else? How do you get most things that you want in life that you don't know? Amazon. Amazon is the answer. So uh, that's, she got her, the uh, toxic chemicals, some from her workplace, some from Amazon. So she put this all on, on the doorknob, and she, the, uh, so, it was never, it's not very effective, I have to say. Uh, so uh, Berlinda Haynes uh, noticed that, that her hand, she had a little rash on it. She asked the police what was going, you know, could they come? The, the police showed no interest at all. But then the mistake was Bond put some in her mailbox. And then at first she called the police. The police said, that's probably just cocaine. Don't worry about it. But the uh, postal <laughs> authorities, the postal authorities realized that someone was tampering with her mailbox. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and so the federal authorities then brought a prosecution against her. For what? Uh, it turns out there is a federal law that bans the use of chemical weapons. Uh, and where does this come from? The United States entered into the International Chemical Weapons Convention, an international treaty banning the use of chemical weapons. And that obligates the signing states to pass laws banning their citizens from using chemical weapons. And that's what Congress did. But the question was, where does Congress get the authority to do this? As we remember from constitutional law, right, Congress, we're a government of enumerated powers. When the national government acts, the question is, where's their authority? Commerce clause, something else. Here, the authority the government claimed was just implementing this treaty. And that was the question. Can Congress really do that? That whenever they say we're implementing a treaty, they can pass any law they want not subject to the usual constraints, right? So Congress couldn't ban this if there weren't a treaty, but if there is a treaty, Congress can ban it. Now, we had a case back in 1920 where Justice Holmes said yes, said if there's a treaty, basically, Congress can do whatever it wants to implement that treaty, even if they couldn't do it without the treaty. Now, 1920, this was a time when Congress's powers were, were, were much more limited than they are today. So there's always been this question, is this good law? And there's been certainly a concern that if this were good law, it might vastly expand the power of the national government. A little fear then, if there are things that the federal government shouldn't be doing, can it basically give itself authority by entering into international treaties? And then, okay, whatever we agree to do, we can then implement through national law. Right, and, and uh, there's been you know, some people fear, but what about weapons? You know, if, it's, uh, if Congress can't regulate firearms, what if there were an international treaty? Could Congress then do things there? So that was the question that now it seemed the Supreme Court might answer in the case of the United States versus Bond. But sorry, I'm also kind of a history guy. So uh, Justice, they filed, though, not Holmes, but Brandeis, who is a guy who would avoid constitutional questions whenever possible. So the majority ducked. Now, the problem was, the statute here said, basically, it is a federal crime to use chemical weapons to try to harm somebody. So if you look at the language of the statute, it seemed to apply exactly to this case. But the majority of the court said, no, we don't think the statute reaches this. Why? Not because of the text of the statute, but because as we understand what Congress was trying to do, they couldn't have been trying to do this. I'm not sure exactly what they were doing, but this they couldn't do. So six of the justices said, we say the statute just doesn't cover this conduct, so we don't need to reach that difficult constitutional question. So they avoided reaching that, although well, that was the six of them. Right, so it's a 9-0 decision to reverse the conviction. Six justices, fairly modest opinion by Chief Justice Roberts, 
three much less modest justices, uh, uh, Scalia, Thomas, and Alito, who said, no, we're, we look at the text. The language of the statute covers this. So we have to reach the constitutional question, and we say this is unconstitutional. Congress simply does not have an independent power to implement a treaty. Only if Congress has some other power, commerce power, something like that, can Congress implement a treaty. And show a great concern about, about expanding the reach of the national government through these treaties, and said so treaties should only reach international matters. It shouldn't be regulating you know, some fight between two neighbors about mailboxes. Right. Uh, and so you can see this concern about implementing treaties. And for the moment then, this really just continues the great debate in the United States about international law and about the place of international law in the United States. And you know, in general, the United States enters into treaties with other countries. Um, and when it does, it generally expects other countries to implement those treaties. Uh, and that's just an issue we have with our federal system. You know, from the perspective of other countries, you know, say, what about the powers of Ohio? I mean, Ohio is an address from the perspective of other countries. It's not a state. So how can the United States enter into international treaties if it can't enforce them through the powers of Congress? So that's a question that may remain on the agenda going forward, not definitively answered by the Supreme Court here. All right, NLRB versus Noel Canning about the president's appointment powers. As we remember, the basic way in which officers are appointed is they're appointed by the president with the advice and consent of the Senate. However, as you may recall, there's been some glitches more recently in the appointment process. It's been very difficult to get the Senate to act on presidential appointments. So as a response to that, presidents in various ways have looked to recess. Uh, here's my little recess picture. OK, uh, presidents like recess because this gives them a special power. Under the Constitution, the president shall have the power to fill up vacancies that may happen during the recess of the Senate by granting commissions which shall expire at the end of the next session. The question is, what is the scope, then, of this recess appointment power? Uh, the case that actually raised it, and there's a little fight over this. All right, uh, anyhow, that's the fight during recess picture. OK. Uh, so uh, the second session of the 112th Congress began on January 3rd. Uh, and then the Senate said, we're going to hold these sessions, pro forma sessions. No business was conducted. They would just say, we're going to meet and then adjourn. Uh, they did it on January 3rd. They did it on January 6th. Why did they do it? To try to prevent the president from making recess appointments. The president, however, said, it doesn't matter. I'm going to make my recess appointments. Uh, and he was having a particular problem with the National Labor Relations Board. There are five members of the National Labor Relations Board. You need three to do anything. There are only two members of the National Labor Relations Board. And the president could not get the Senate to act on his three nominees. So he said, fine, there's a recess between January 3rd and January 6th. I'm going to appoint three members of the National Labor Relations Board so now they can make these decisions. And the question was, was the recess appointment power robust enough to allow the president to do this? Okay. Now, there was a company that objected to it, a company that cans beverages which are not normally found on the Emory campus. So we'll block that out. OK. So uh, the question then was, uh, how, do we look at, how do we interpret this language, right? Uh, what about vacancies that exist before the recess? Right? Um, and part of the issue was, it seemed that in the minds of the framers probably was the way Congress then operated the way state legislatures tend to operate today, which is January, you meet for a couple months, then you recess. Right? The first session of Congress, start in January, go for a couple of months, you recess till the next January. Right? Uh, that's not the way Congress operates anymore. Right? They're kind of in continuous session. All right. So what about if the vacancy happened before the recess? Well, look at the language. You have the power to fill up vacancies that may happen during the recess. Does that mean that? The position had to be full before the recess, and then the vacancy occurred. Right. Uh, what about intra-session recesses? So clearly, your session goes from January to March, then you recess till the next session. Fine. That's a recess. But now when you meet all year round, and you know, you take a break at Easter, you take a break at Fourth of July, you take a break at Labor Day, you're about to take a, a break now to run for re-election. What about that? Well, can you look at the language during the recess of the Senate? Maybe the recess of just one, which is the recess between the sessions, 
not you know, whenever you happen to take a break. Okay. It's also the length of the recess. Is it only several months, several weeks? When you take a lunch break, how long? Right? Three days. Was three days enough? And then can the Senate just count, interfere with the president's power by saying, we're going to say we're in session. We're not going to have any business. We're not going to do anything. We're just going to show up and say we're in session. Is that enough? So that was the range of questions that were presented by this case. Now, nine to nothing, the Supreme Court said the appointments were unconstitutional. But again, nine to nothing, a sharply divided Supreme Court said the appointments were unconstitutional. So five justices, in opinion by Justice Breyer, said, look, what we're going to do is accept what was historically done. So this issue of does the recess, uh, sorry, can the vacancy be in place before the recess? Since at least 1820, presidents have interpreted this to allow them to make recess appointments, even if the, the vacancy was there before Senate went into recess. That 1820 is pretty good. All right. Uh, now, four justices led, uh, Justice O'Connor concurred in the judgment and said, we don't really care so much about the history. We look at the text. Right? And that led to this division here. So what about vacancies that exist before the recess? Again, Justice Breyer said, we've done it for 100 and almost 200 years. That's good enough. Scalia said, no, if it's wrong, it's wrong. The fact that we've been doing it for 200 years doesn't matter. Right? What about a recess in between the session? Again, five to four, yes. That practice seems like maybe it was only 70 to 80 years old. It depends a little bit how you read that history. Again, we have Breyer here saying, look, this is the way things have happened. It's actually pretty typical of the different ways in which Breyer and Scalia look at the Constitution. They have a little road show, by the way. Breyer and Scalia, they like to go on the road and have their arguments. And Breyer, it's more about, let's accommodate. Let's find something that works. The Constitution is about accommodating political structures, not about grammar. Right? And it's a little bit of difference there of how Scalia sees it. How about the length of the recess? Uh, there, Breyer said, well, three days is too short. Why? Because it just seems short. I mean, part of the problem is, <laughs> if you're, if you're going to, if once you're going to accept, you know, that is, it doesn't have to be the recess. You have to find it's three. Well, that's too short, right? And he said, well, probably ten days would be long enough. Why? Uh, not really clear. All right. Uh, and then also, what about these pro forma sessions? Right? Breyer said basically, if the Senate says it's in session, it's in session. We're not going to look behind what the Senate is doing. Now, obviously, you could, right? I mean, C-SPAN is there. You know, it's fascinating watching. You can see what they're doing. But the justice said, we're not going to do that. They say they're in session. They're in session. So nine to nothing that this exercise of the recess appointment power is unconstitutional, but really five to four upholding the traditional ways in which presidents had made recess appointments. Though now it's clear if the Senate wants to prevent it, it can just use this pro forma session to prevent the president from doing this. And we will just see, as you know, this appointments issue led to the so-called nuclear option, where the Democrats said now there'd be no more filibustering of presidential appointments. So we will just see in this ongoing debate uh, how NLRB versus Canning plays out. All right, religious accommodation. Another uh, big issue in the Supreme Court. We saw this term. And religious accommodation may depend a little bit on you know, what turns out a little bit what religion. Uh, all right, some early cases about the Amish who won. More recent cases about Native Americans who lost. Uh, but this case was about Hobby Lobby. Under the Affordable Care Act, large employers must provide health insurance or pay a fee. And under the implementing regulations, that insurance must include contraceptive coverage at no cost to the insured person. Now, there was an exemption for religious nonprofits, churches, basically. Uh, but here, there was a for-profit corporation, Hobby Lobby, that 18,000 employees who said it's against our religious beliefs to provide certain kinds of contraceptive coverage for our employees. Now, the basis of their claim was the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, a statute that Congress enacted, saying that the federal government may not substantially burden a person's religious exercise unless there is a compelling governmental interest and you can't do it any other way. So uh, in, in 1990, the Supreme Court had narrowed the scope of the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment of the Constitution. And Congress now passed a statute to try to broaden it a bit. Question was, how did that apply here? Right? Uh, and what's five to four, the Supreme Court said the Affordable Care Act it violated the Religious Freedom Restoration Act to force Hobby Lobby to provide contraceptive coverage. First, it said corporations are persons. The Religious Freedom Restoration Act said persons' religious 
exercise can't be burdened. Again, there's a line of cases now, Citizens United and, uh, and campaign contributions. So corporations are person. And so this is a substantial burden. They, uh, the owners of Hobby Lobby, a closely held corporation, have a religious belief against certain forms of contraception, which they believe is abortion. So they have to do that or pay a fee. Right? And with some argument, by the way, it doesn't violate the religious beliefs because they don't actually have to do it. They just have to do it or pay a fee. But they say, well, that was a burden enough. They said, we assume that there is a compelling interest. But this is not the least restrictive means. There's a different way in which the government could advance its interest. So I'm talk about that for a minute. Now, the majority noted two alternatives. They said one other way is the government itself could just pay rather for this contraceptive insurance. Now, a little bit of a broad holding, because if that's true, if a less restrictive mean is the government can pay, well, that the government could pay for everything, right? I mean, in part, we'll see. So what about it's against my religious beliefs to pay a minimum wage? Well, that's OK, because the government can pay, right? So that could be quite a broad holding with serious implications for the government. They also said, though, look, there was an existing accommodation for religious nonprofits. So the government just had to extend that accommodation to for-profit companies that said it violated their religious beliefs. And Justice Kennedy here wrote a separate opinion saying, I want to make clear that I'm not buying this government pays. Here, you don't need a new program. It's not a new burden. So all what the government has to do is to extend the accommodation they're offering to churches to, not, to for-profit corporations like Hobby Lobby. What's the big deal? Well, and that's the question, is after Hobby Lobby. So one question is, is this, is this sufficient? Saying that is, there was an accommodation offered for churches for religious nonprofits. Is that enough of an accommodation? The majority said, we do not decide whether this other approach would comply. Uh, and now there's another case headed for the Supreme Court where a religious organization said, the accommodation still violates our religious beliefs because the accommodation is, we tell our insurer that we don't want to cover this. And then the insurer will cover it itself. And the way that works in terms of economics is it turns out if you're an insurance company and your choice is A, cover everything except for contraception, or B, cover everything, you choose B, because B is cheaper, because contraception is cheaper than pregnancy. So the idea is insurance companies would do it anyhow. But some of these religious groups said, it's against our religious beliefs to tell the insurance company that we don't want it to be covered, because that would trigger coverage. So we'll just have to see how that plays out. Now, what about other laws? Well, you know that we have civil rights laws. Uh, what about that? Can a company say, my religious beliefs don't allow me to hire people of different religions, people of different races, people of different genders, people of different sexual orientations? What about that? Well, maybe some comfort from the majority's opinion. The government has a compelling interest in providing equal opportunity to participate in the workforce without regard to race. And prohibitions on racial discrimination are precisely tailored to achieve that goal. So I guess if it's about race discrimination, you can't claim a religious exemption. So what about other kinds of discrimination, right? That just left open there about other kinds of um, potential discrimination and whether there could be religious exemptions from those laws. And still a question about how you're going to pay for this. Because this accommodation seemed to work OK, that, that scenario I told you, when it was insurance companies. But if you're self-insured, like Emory is, for example, uh, so Emory actually pays the insurance claims. It's administered by Aetna, but it's Emory's money. So if you're a self-insured company, how are the claims actually going to be paid? And it's just it's not clear how that is actually going to work. And when it was just religious nonprofits, it was a very small group. It didn't really matter. Maybe the government would just pay. Now it's a much bigger group. Serious questions about how that's going to be covered. All right. Uh, so, just note here, by the way, so far we've had Bond and Noel Canning, which were so-called unanimous cases, Hobby Lobby divided 5-4, but if you look at the actual opinions, not much difference between the so-called unanimous cases and the non-unanimous cases. Still a very divided court, uh, a court fairly divided along ideological lines. Question? No, just a comment. A comment. Um, I attended a conference this year, uh, we had a professor from Simple pre-presentation. Yeah. Yeah, about 20, 22 cases. What I noticed was that 
that three women on the Supreme Court, right? Yes. Okay. They voted together probably 20 out of the 21 times, and the, the, the 24th time, one of them accused himself. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. 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 So my question is, is that a trend, and so what is it, and how do you deal with it? Well, <laughs> how do I deal with it? Uh, so, <laughs> uh, I would say, maybe the response would be something like this is, um, it is pretty easy to do diagrams like this for the Supreme Court. You can pretty much line up the justices from left to right, uh, and you can have a fairly straight red line because that's the way the justices divide. The three most liberal justices on this Supreme Court are Sonia Sotomayor, Ruth Gader, Bader Ginsburg, and Elena Kagan. And they will vote together more often than, than other justices. Justice Breyer is somewhat less liberal. And in a vast array of cases, you can predict at least how this alignment will happen. Now, it may be that, that you know, this case, Roberts will come, and these three justices are more conservative. So this is a fit. You can really understand the ideology of this court along almost any kind of case. And that's different from the past. We had Justice White, who believed in strong government power, but he was a big supporter of the government and criminal rights, criminal procedure cases. This court, you can really predict how these justices vote. And that's part of a very ideologically divided court. Yeah, question. Uh, does the fact that Hobby Lobby was a closely held corporation uh, do it? I mean, what if a, a, a broadly held corporation like UPS or, or, or any other one that does that, will that start playing in? Well, we'll see. I mean, that is the court. I mean, the court noted it was a closely held, a family held corporation, not a publicly held corporation. But the court's reasoning. I mean, the question they said it is the the question is raised. What about if this were a much more broadly held company? And the response is. We doubt that uh, a company that with broad shareholders would agree that this would violate their religious beliefs. But suggesting maybe if they did, then maybe it would be the same. So I, I think it'd be hard to know how to limit it if a company actually, however a company can do this, comes forward and says it violates our religious beliefs. OK. Uh, two more cases I want to talk about briefly. Uh, one is the Riley case. OK. Uh, criminal procedure. Now, you may, may know in general. Under the Fourth Amendment, if the police want to search something, they need a warrant. But that's very general, we could say. Um, so uh, and what actually happened uh, to uh, David Riley here was he was driving his car, and he was pulled over for having an expired registration. We pull somebody over for that. And then the police found out that his license uh, had been suspended. So they impounded his car. Now, when you impound a car, you can do what's called an inventory search. Don't need a warrant for that. Just find out what's in the car. Well, I happened to inventory under the hood and found two loaded firearms. So then they arrested him for carrying firearms. Now, then there was another exception. When you arrest somebody, you can search them and look at what they have in their possession. The thought is that's necessary for the safety of the officer and to preserve evidence. And what did they find in Riley's pocket? a cell phone. They then searched the contents of the cell phone. And they found some of his texts, which apparently had the, um, uh, the label on them, CK, which was Crips Killers, uh, which was the gang that he seemed to be a member of, along with certain films, little videos that they found uh, showing gang-related activity. And based on that, he was charged in California. There's an enhancement for being a gang member. So he was charged with that. And that's the question. Does this search incident to arrest apply to cell phones? Now, previously, the court seemed to say, we need a categorical rule. If, if it's in your pocket, the police can search it. We can't have a case-by-case -case analysis of, well, what if it's a diary? What if it's a cigarette pack? What if it's this? It's, if it's there, you can search it. So the question was, what about here? Uh, and here, the Supreme Court unanimously, and this was unanimous opinion, said no. Said a cell phone is just categorically different. It has just different kinds of information on it. Uh, now, it was raised, look, if a justification is preserving evidence, there's a greater risk of losing evidence with a cell phone than almost anything else, because it potentially could be wiped, could be, uh, the information could be eliminated remotely, unlike most stuff, which is you have it, you have it. You can wait for a warrant. The Supreme Court said, it doesn't matter. It's probably preventable. And we see Chief Justice Roberts dipping his toe a little bit in technology, said you just use a Faraday bag. Anyhow, apparently you wrap aluminum foil around a cell phone and it, it interferes with reception. You can try it at home. OK, so <laughs> anyway, so we see here the United States Supreme Court grappling with 
new technology, right? And, uh, you know, this has not in general been a court that's sympathetic to Fourth Amendment claims. But we see here the court saying this is enough. We do need to rethink the traditional rules in this new digital age, right? So that's one analysis. Of course, some have just analyzed it as <laughs> justices have cell phones. So it just means a little bit different to, th different to them uh, than, than Fourth Amendment issues that arise in other contexts. Okay. Last issue we're going to talk about is race, a persistent issue for the United States Supreme Court and for this court uh, in particular. Uh, going back to Greta versus Bollinger, 2003, the United States Supreme Court, in a five to four opinion, said race-based affirmative action was constitutional if it was done in a narrowly tailored fashion because diversity is a compelling governmental interest. Uh, Justice O'Connor was the deciding vote. She has retired. Uh, and now the Supreme Court seems to be little by little retreating from that position. But this case raised a slightly different question. After that Michigan Supreme Court case, Michigan itself amended its state constitution to prohibit affirmative action. And the question was, was, and then in response to that, there was then a decline in minority enrollment at the University of Michigan undergraduate and law school. And this case raised the issue of whether a state is permitted to ban affirmative action or whether that in itself may violate the Equal Protection Clause. A closely divided Sixth Circuit said it was unconstitutional to restructure the political process in this way. And there were some earlier cases that had suggested that. The basic argument was, look, before this Michigan Amendment, uh, a student could go to the regents of the University of Michigan and they could say, uh, you should let in more football players. You should let in more tuba players. You should let in more children of alumni. All of that they could say. After the amendment, they can say all of that. But what they can't say is, you should let in more students of racial minorities to enhance diversity. And the reasoning was, that's unconstitutional to single out that one kind of criteria for saying you can't make the argument for that being uh, a valid uh, preference, right? So you can argue for tuba players, you can argue for alumni, but you can't argue for racial diversity. That's what they said. Uh, dissent in the Sixth Circuit said, state does not deny equal treatment by mandating it. United States Supreme Court upheld the ban on affirmative action in a divided court. The basic holding was six to two, saying Michigan could do this. Uh, so we had six justices, uh, well, we had three justices, I'm sorry, who basically said, this political process idea that you can't restructure the political process to harm racial minorities may be true, but that's not how we read this. We don't think this did target racial minorities. Then you had Scalia and Thomas basically said, oh, this did target racial minorities, but that's OK. Uh, it's just the, the, that is the, there is no political process doctrine, basically. Look, if you can prove that there was an intent to harm racial minorities, OK. But assuring equal treatment is not a race-based harm. And then Justice Breyer often likes to go his own way, said, you know, here, rather than having the unelected regents of the University of Michigan do this, having an elected body, the people of Michigan, is, is different, so he wasn't too bothered by that. But in some ways, the most interesting opinion was a very strong dissent by Justice Sotomayor. Uh, her dissent was longer than all the other opinions in the case put together, a very passionate dissent that she read from the bench, where she noted that an ending affirmative action led to a decrease in minority enrollment. And she took this opportunity to respond to an argument that Chief Justice Roberts had made in a different case in 2007. Apparently, that had been bugging her for a long time. And this was her chance to get that off her system. In 2007, Chief Justice Roberts had said, the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. Right? Pithy, strong, seems to argue for a race-blind constitution. Right? In this different case, Justice Sotomayor cites that and says, that is a sentiment out of touch with reality one not required by our Constitution. The way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to speak openly and candidly on the subject of race and to apply the Constitution with eyes open to the unfortunate effects of centuries of racial discrimination. And now Justice Roberts wrote a separate opinion in the Schutte case just to respond to Justice Sotomayor's opinion. Right, you got the impression like, I'm a reasonable guy, what's going on? You know, people can disagree in good faith on this issue but it does more harm than good to question just the openness and candor of those on the other side of the debate. I mean, you say, I'm an open guy, I'm a candid guy, why are you taking this occasion to call me out? 
And it is, I'd say, a little bit unusual in Supreme Court opinions to individually target another justice for a statement they made in a case seven years earlier. And it's clear that this was Justice Sotomayor's, that she was getting her voice. She wanted to put down her marker for what she thinks about race on the Supreme Court and the importance of affirmative action. All right, what do we see then? Some of the themes of the term we noted, uh, voting's a unanimous ruling, but not a unanimous opinion. We certainly saw that in some of our cases. Uh, we saw some cases where Scalia, Thomas, and Alito voted to overrule precedent. It was the Bond case, the Canning case, the Schutte case. Not a majority, but maybe in future cases we'll see that. Again, the law professor's uh, you know, line here, purpose in history versus text, right? Bond, the court went for purpose. Scalia and Alito went for text. And so anyway, all of these cases, uh, we see the court going for purpose rather than text. But if you look at this line, I think, again, uh, somehow uh, understanding libertarian as being, being sympathetic to claims of individual liberty, skeptical about claims of government power, that certainly was a theme that we saw in these cases on this Supreme Court, and I think it certainly is a theme that we've seen over several terms. And then what about that other question we began with? Is it a divided court? Is it a Kennedy court? I think we'd have to say uh, it certainly is at least a Kennedy court. He's certainly the way to bet. When the court's unanimous, of course he's there. When it's 6-3, he's in the 6. When it's 5-4, he's in the 5. Right? Uh, there he is both times. And when it's 3-2-2-1, uh, two, two, he's in the 3. Right? So well, whatever else we may say about this Supreme Court, uh, Justice Kennedy is in, in a way, the driver's seat. Uh, he's the one to look to. And as we think about how the Supreme Court's going to act in cases in the future, certainly all eyes will continue to be on Justice Kennedy. So thanks very much. Okay. All right. Looks like we have uh, five minutes uh, for questions, and then afterwards I'll be happy to stay. I'm sure others may want to go and, and drink some more mimosas, which I'll do. All right. Yeah. Check. What, if, what if someone in government says, okay, here's a real recess, recess coming up. It's going to be longer than three days. Look at the opinion. So I'm going to resign during that real recess, and then I can have the president appoint someone as my successor. Yeah, no, no, uh, to be clear is, actually, remember, the, the, the majority, five to four, was that you don't have to resign. If you want to, you can resign before the recess if you want to. So it's still the case when you have a recess of at least 10 days, the president can fill that recess. I mean, fill that, fill that position with a recess appointment. That was the effect of the majority's holding here, right? Again, that's what uh, the other four justices didn't like, but that's where Kennedy was the decisive vote to say you can do that. So, all right. Yeah, trust me. There was a case three, four, five years ago about, I think it was Rose in the D.C. Police Department. They put a GPS on a known drug dealer in his car, and it was the same thing. They threw out all the evidence. So it, it seems to be this, this electronic bar. Right. That's exactly right. That, that was, in a way, I mean, it was a you know, different doc, doctrine, but it was the same, in a sense, mindset, right, that you can't just put GPS tracking and everything, which apparently the FBI had done a lot. I mean, it, that really led to a lot of police practice. There's a lot of body shop work uh, they had to do after that case to take all of their GPS tracking devices off cars. Yeah? Uh, can you give us like three or four cases next term that we would be interested in? Well, you know, I'd say, um, you know, so far it has not been, in the cases the Supreme Court has actually decided to hear, there has been nothing that exciting, uh, at least from my perspective. I have to say, by the way, a big absence in this presentation. The Supreme Court lately has shown great interest and aptitude for intellectual property. I, however, do not have great interest or aptitude in that area, so I didn't cover those cases. So there may be some intellectual property cases, but there are a tremendous number of possibilities, right? Same-sex marriage cases bubbling up from all over the country, right? And the Supreme Court may decide they want to wait a little while before hearing that, but that will come up eventually. Another Affordable Care Act case. Uh, the real challenge to the Affordable Care Act about whether the way the statute is written, it accidentally prevented the federal government from providing subsidies for national health exchanges, uh, which could really gut the Affordable Care Act. Uh, that would be uh, another case. There are abortion restrictions. Uh, there's been a new round of restrictive cases about abortions, generally saying that you have to be uh, you have to have admitting privileges at a hospital or other kinds of. There's actually, I mean, everyone agrees on the name. We call them trap. Tar targeted regulation of abortion providers. So those cases may come up. So a lot of cases bubbling up from the circuits, but the Supreme Court has not yet decided to hear any of them. Yeah, question. 
So is the moral of the story to read the Chamber of Commerce brief in case you're interested? <laughs> I would say, yeah, read the Chamber of Commerce brief, or that's right, or maybe get the Chamber of Commerce on your side. So, uh, well, anyhow, have it. So, yeah, I'd say uh, the Chamber of Commerce tends to be successful. Uh, not always. They don't get everything that they want, but uh, it, as you see, that certainly are generally the winners on this court. If you were making odds, who would you guess is our, our next couple of justices to retire? Well, <laughs> you know, it's. Uh, Again, I don't, I'm not good at odds, but I guess you look at actuarial tables. I mean, uh, uh, ju ju so Justice Ginsburg is 81, right? Uh, and so it would seem like she might retire. And there's a theory, look, this is the you know, waning days of the Obama administration. She'd want to retire to give the next appointment to President Obama. Uh, she has been pretty clear that she's not too happy about all the speculation. Actually, when I was in Washington, there was an Emory College alum who had her as a law school professor and they kept in touch. So very recently, they had seen each other at some event. And Justice Ginsburg said, oh, are you still working? The person said, yes, I haven't retired yet. And Justice Ginsburg said, you don't need to ask me. I'm not retiring yet either. So uh, it seems that uh, that, you know, it's a speculation. Uh, but uh, maybe that uh, these justices hang on for a while. OK. Uh, well then, again, thanks, everybody. Uh, appreciate your being here.